Oh, look at that beautiful river. You've never seen a sight so beautiful in your life, you know? Especially if it's got some sewage effluent and maybe a couple dead uh, invasivation carp floating down it, you know? Used to have a lot of fun here back in the day watching the carp come up, you know? And, uh, you know, feeding them and what the shit, you know, they come up, they're pretty hideous looking. They almost look like catfish. Carp, of course, are uh, uh, the same species as koi, I believe. They just haven't gone through all the uh, human selective pressure that koi have. But, uh, yeah, they're, they're in these... Uh, in these rivers, you know, you watch them come up. I don't I see any right now. Anyway, I've been coming to this spot for 20 years. And, uh, you know, it's pretty nice. It's uh, right off Ashland, right off Ashland Avenue. Actually, when I was a kid, a couple of friends used to live under that bridge. There's a little house over there. Used to be able to get in there. You, they paint, you know, there was a bunch of graffiti in there. They paint a couple of them uh, hold up in there. You know, turn it into a little clubhouse. It was pretty nice, actually. And then one day we woke up and there were some city workers uh, you know, urinating in what was our living room, and uh, they were nice, they didn't tell us to get out or anything, but they didn't really seem a uh, phase bias at all. One of them had a mustache the size of, uh, you know, a dust broom. But uh, anyway, in this spot, we used to go hang up there. I mean, I, I'm sober now, but back in the day, we used to drink beers up there, you know? They're like 17. You, you climb up on the stairs, there used to be stairs right there, and then they took them down, and then you could get up there, and this is old cantilever bridge. I think it's a cantilever bridge. I don't know. It looks like they're having a problem with the uh, concrete, though. They got the little stilts holding it up. I think it's the I think it's decrepit. But we'd hang out up there. You climb up all the way up. It's a little scary, you know. The graffiti guys still get up there. They got you know there's graffiti up there still. But it used to be a lot easier to get up. You know you could still get up there. But uh, we'd hang out there, watch the sunset over there to the west. You know, drink a couple old styles, which of course you get a six pack for about I don't know three twenty nine. You know, it used to be a really nice feeling that, uh, I mean, the thought of drinking now kind of makes me want to puke, especially being around drunk people. But, you know, uh, back in the day, it was really nice. You know, you get like a nice 90 degree day and a couple of uh, ice cold ones. You go sit by the river, smell the river and uh, and watch uh, watch the sunset. Anyway, this one over here, I want to show you this plant. It's actually cool to see a native plant growing in the uh, Chicago city limits and thriving. This is Vitus riparia. And it's uh, a true grape, as you can see. Uh, you know, wine grapes, of course, the same genus. Vitus riparian, it's, it's doing pretty well. It's a native uh, North American uh, grape, and it's doing, doing spectacular. There's also a close relative of it that's uh, actually quite invasive. I'm not stuck through there. Break my ass. There's another close relative and you know this one because they got it on all the ball fields over here. They call it Boston Ivy, but it's not from Boston, you know. It's not from Boston any more than I'm from fucking Switzerland. You got this guy over here. It's a same family as that Vitus Riparia. Parthenocystis tricuspidata. This right here. You get up there. And this one's actually flowering. You know, so it's, I don't know if it's invasive. Maybe it's a little invasive, but it's not too bad. You know, and it kind of adds some character. Obviously, you want the uh, you want the native vitus, being that it evolved here, and it's probably got a lot of uh, native uh, insects and other animals that uh, you know have, uh, of course, evolved with it, and uh, you know, accustomed to using it. It's better for the ecosystem to have native plants, but uh, you know, you take what you can get if you live in a fucking concrete toilet, right? So you can see how glabrous, you can see how glabrous this is, the leaf surface of this. Leaf surface is a little bit bit different. The flowers are a little bit different, of course, even though that Vitus riparia wasn't flowering. Got the same thing going on, where it's just able to cling to the wall. Uh, Abaxial surface is different too. That Vitus had a little bit, bit of fuzz. This is completely uh, glabrous. Oh, this guy's a banger too. Acer Nagundo, box elder. It's a maple, even though it doesn't have what many would consider true maple leaves. It's got more of a pinnate thing going on. It is a true maple. It does produce Samaras. And uh, it, acts, it actually fucking thrives here. It does very well in the Midwest. You got a subspecies in California too, but it's more riparian. You know, because California summers are so dry, the, the air is so arid, you know, that you need a... It needs to grow in riparian areas. Most, most species of maple need a good amount of water. I don't think there's any that are very drought tolerant, you know. So that's why when you go down to Mexico, you only got a couple little maple areas, and they're higher up in the mountains, and they're they're more uh, what you would call 
you got more of a paleo relictual thing going on. They're left over from the Ice Age, and they've retreated to those high mountaintops where it's colder. But box elder, Acer Nagundo's real great plant. And you come over here, hey, look, you got a milkweed going on. Milkweed's driving through. Nice Asclepius. Not doing as well as it should. It could be a little bit bigger. Oh, this is nice. Relative of poinsettias. This is a Euphorbia dentata right here. And you can see those Euphorbia, those reduced Euphorbia flowers if you look at it. Where the hell? This fucking camera doesn't want to focus anymore. It's a real pain in my ass. Anyway, you can see it. See that? See the stamens down there? And that reduced, that is the flower. Those little star-shaped antennas popping up. That's actually the flower of this Euphorbia dentata. And this is actually a native, you know. No one knows exactly where it's native. It's native to somewhere in North or South America. But it's, you know, what you would call a weedy native. It does well for itself. It gets around, etc. And then this, this guy... It's the bees actually love this plant. It's a common honey plant. Metalotus alba. Oh. Alba or albus, I forget which one. Either way, pea family. Get up there and look at it. Well, first off, you got the trifolia leaves, okay, which could give it away as Fabaceae, the pea family. You know? That's a good giveaway. Even though, like I said, you should never use leaves as an identifying factor. But you look up there. Get up there and look at it. You got that. Once you know, you look at this spike of flowers the compound inflorescence, inflorescence, and you look at every tiny flower and you realize it's got their pea, their pea family flower leaves. Typical, uh, does it have a banner and wings and keeling with this shit? Zygomorphic pattern going on. This is actually from Europe, but, uh, you know, whatever. It's probably fixing some nitrogen down there, making this fucking railroad ballast, uh, okay. <laughs> making the railroad ballast a little bit richer for everybody. But, uh, you know, they get out of control. They can outcompete natives, too, but uh, doesn't seem to be that bad. And then, of course, this guy is Ilanthus altissima. And this guy can be a fucking pain in the ass, super invasive, takes over. They call it Tree of Heaven. There was a book wrote, writ, uh, about it called uh, Tree Gross in Brooklyn, Ilanthus altissima. You know, same family as the crucifixion thorn, which we get in the deserts. Uh, Castilla and Morii crucifixion thorn, which we get in the deserts, but this is native to Asia. I think it was brought over to Philly because they, they, one of the guys over there in Philly, he wanted to do a silk moth thing with this because there's a moth, a moth who treats this as a host plant and it produces silk. But of course, you know, nobody knew shit about ecology back then. Fuck, 80% of people, 90%, 95% of people still don't know anything about ecology. They got no concept of it. You know, I'm doing my best to change that. But uh, regardless, guy didn't know about ecology. This is like, we're talking late 1700s. And he brought this over and, uh, you know, and uh, it just got loose, you know. And then, of course, the settlers, a lot of, you know, white settlers and whatever the shit would take it to little towns in California. And you get it in California, too, but it doesn't get established too well because you don't have humid summers in California, of course. And it's a little guy, too. They're trying to eradicate it, right? They get really big. I remember, you know, when I was a little a teenage uh, miscreant and a vandal we'd use them to climb trees to get on rooftops to paint graffiti and you know you'd always be climbing up and then uh, the limbs would break because it's real light white wood and you'd break your ass you know and it was uh, it was kind of a pain in the ass but uh you know it did the job oh i remember the the wood kind of smells like goat piss too you know why well, not that i really know what goat piss smells like but i assume it smells pretty bad it smells like piss that's all you gotta know and here's a full-grown tree. Again, it's Atlantis Saltissima, tree of heaven. So, anyway, that's it for that. That's it for the now. You know, nice little segment, short little ditty on a, a weeds and plants of the railroad tracks of the Chicago area. I'll do a little bit more later. Go fuck yourself. Bye.